Take out your Bibles with me this morning. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Teresa was just singing a beautiful song about the blood of Jesus Christ shed for us, the love that he had for us. Our worship team focused on that a good bit in their music as well this morning. And I want to encourage you with something. Last Sunday night, we had a time of spontaneous worship and prayer. It was a wonderful time in the presence of God. God ministered powerfully last Sunday night as we came together for worship and prayer. Tonight, we have a very special communion service prepared. The message I'm going to be preaching, Lord willing, is remembering and renewing. Remembering and renewing. And I want to encourage you to come out tonight. Another powerful opportunity to come into the presence of God. Set aside that time in your busy schedule, your hectic week, just to draw nearer and closer to God and to fellowship in this very special communion service tonight. Remembering and renewing. How many of you all know and realize that there are things in our life that are good for us? Things in our life that are a tremendous blessing for us, but yet they can get lost in the hecticness of life. It's good for us to remember those things. And then we all need renewing, don't we? That's one of the reasons why God created us to sleep at night. I know some of you may have a challenge with that, but isn't it wonderful when you get a good, restful night's sleep? And the same thing is with our spiritual walk. We, we need to have physical renewing. We need to have mental renewing. We need to have spiritual renewing. So I want to encourage you to come out to the house of the Lord tonight for this very special communion service. But today... This morning, I want to talk to you about relationships. Praise God. <laughs> you know, establish and building strong relationships seems to be so complicated in our society today, doesn't it? Seems to be such a challenge to be able to establish and to be able to build and develop uh, strong relationships today. You know, whether it's a romantic relationship or whether it's a, a friendship, a good friendship, there are so many issues that, uh, that you have to overcome in order to establish a healthy relationship. But I want to tell you this morning, Genesis chapter 2, I had you to turn there, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18 it just kind of strips away all the complexities of relationship building and kind of gets right down to the nuts and bolts. What it really does, it gives us God's perspective on relationships. I want you to go there with me. Look down in your text this morning, Genesis 2, 18, and it says, God speaking here, God speaking here, it is not good for man to be alone. Some of you guys got it. Man, I gave you a perfect opportunity, man. Now, I, let me, let me, I know you were focused on the word and on what pastor was saying, so I'll, I'll give you this chance again. It is not good for man to be alone. Amen. There we go. And then what does he say? I will make a helper who is just right for him. The New Living Translation. I will make a helper who is just right for him. What is God saying here? Well, he's telling us a couple of things very specifically, and I'm sure there's a number of other things we could glean from even this short passage, but God is telling us some very specific things concerning relationships. And the first thing God is telling us, he's telling us that he always intended for us to share life with others. It's always been God's plan for individuals, for man, for woman, to share life with others. It's never been, listen, for any individual. I'm going to say that again this morning. It has never been God's will for any individual to not share life with others. Now, I'm not talking marriage right now. I'm talking about relationship. It's always been God's intention for every created individual I want you to pause for a moment. I want you to take your right hand. I want you to put it over, over your chest right here. Do you feel anything? Some of you are having to check two or three times. Simon, get ready. We might have to call 911. 
If your heart is beating, if your chest is going in or out, you are a created being. You were created by God and you were created for relationship. God never intended for anyone to do life alone. God always intended for us to share life with others. That's the first thing there as we look at that. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 and 10 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Now the second thing that God is speaking to us here is God is telling us that he has the perfect plan for meeting our relationship needs. God has the perfect plan for meeting our relationship needs. Uh, needs. So in spite of the challenges we face with relationships and the complexities of those things, God has a clear plan for our success. Can somebody say amen to that this morning? God's looking out for you. He's got a clear plan for your success. Now the key, the key to relational success is this, God-centered relationships. That's the key. Now, you know I'm going to unpack that this morning, but I'm going to give you in a nutshell at the beginning of this. The key, the key to relational success is God-centered relationships. In other words, relationships that place God at the very center, at the core of their existence. Relationships that say God is the foundation. God is the core on which this relationship is established. See, God-centered relationships are not perfect. Can somebody say, oh, me this morning? God-centered relationships are not perfect, yet they are enduring. Why? Because they are established in grace. So let me just give you a couple of things this morning as we kind of unpack this. First of all, we need to do this. We need to quit looking for the perfect relationship. You heard it right. We need to quit looking for the perfect relationship. Pastor, that don't make sense. Well, let me help, let me help you along here. Let me, let me tell you what I'm thinking, what God's speaking to my heart. See, there are several problems with the concept of a perfect relationship. There are several problems that come out of that concept, that idea of a perfect relationship. One of those obstacles to finding the perfect relationship is our perspective. One of the real challenges in being able to find that perfect relationship is our perspective and what perfect really is. First of all, and I know I'm going to burst your bubble, don't get mad at the messenger, I'm just speaking the truth. A problem with our perspective is that our perspective might be a little bit selfish. Can somebody say OB to that one this morning? The perspective we might have in what would be a perfect relationship is probably me-centered, I-centered, instead of on the relationship and on God's will. So if our perspective is off, then what we really need in the relationship is off. It could be a little bit selfish. Our perspective also, hear this this morning, is incomplete. We don't know the future. We have no idea what's going to happen on down the road. We can do everything we can possibly do to try to figure that out. We can do everything we can possibly do. And I'll tell you this, whenever I'm counseling, premarital counseling couples, I try to do my very best to discover everything we possibly can that might be a deterrent to a healthy relationship in the future. But I've got to tell you this, I pray and ask God to be in every one of those sessions because it doesn't matter how many people I've counseled and how long I've done this, I still can't can't predict the future and neither can you and so we have a problem there's a flaw in our perspective in trying to determine what a perfect re uh, relationship should be another obstacle to finding the perfect relationship is this imperfect people think about that for a moment we're trying to look for the perfect relationship and we're looking for the perfect relationship amongst what imperfect people you know, if you study all the great relationships in the Bible, do you know what you find? They're filled with imperfect people. Let me give you a couple of examples this morning. If you look at Abraham and Sarah, they were deeply in love, weren't they? I mean, Abraham and Sarah were deeply, deeply in love. Abraham loved Sarah with all of his heart, and Sarah loved Abraham. As a matter of fact, she loved him so much, she called him what? Lord, ladies, don't you have to really love a guy to say that? <laughs> but guess what happened in their imperfect relationship? 
they had to go down to Egypt. And while they're down in Egypt, living in Egypt, Abraham gets this brilliant idea. Sarah, you're a fox. Man, you're good looking. I, I married up. But the problem is that the Egyptians are going to look at you and they're going to say, she's a fox. And they might take me out to get to you, so I'm, we're just going to say you're my sister. Now think about that. This guy really loves Sarah, but he messes up and tells a story. Well, you know, if you kind of finagle it around, you might be able to say that he's just because they were family. Now forget all that. It was a lie. So we find this beautiful relationship with imperfect people and God had to straighten that whole mess out. Can somebody say amen? amen. Here's another one, Jacob. Jacob loved Rachel. Man, he loved her so much he was willing to work 14 years without any other pay except for paying off the dowry to her dad so that he could marry Rachel. We know the story he worked the first seven years and then he got Leah. And he cared about Leah, but he loved Rachel. So then he agreed to Laban. He said, listen, I'll work another seven years. Just give me Rachel. And so he got Rachel too and he worked another seven years. Wouldn't you say this guy loved Rachel? But this imperfect relationship, they're, they're heading out across the wilderness. They're heading back to Canaan. And Jacob discovers that his brother Esau is coming with the, at him with 400 men. And so what does he do? He sends Rachel and the children out in front of him. <laughs> Now, I'm sure he was hoping, you know, that, that Esau would see the women and children, you know, and soften his heart, but he didn't know what was going to happen. That's imperfect people. What about David and Jonathan? Talking about friendships, not even romantic love, but David and Jonathan, they were the best of friends. The best of friends. But think about how messed up that relationship was. Jonathan's father, King Saul, was trying to kill David. Could you imagine going over to your buddy's house and having his dad throwing a javelin at you, you know? You might not want to hang out very often. What are we talking about? We're talking about relationships with imperfect people. People are going to let you down. People are going to flat out let you down. I can't predict the future, but I can tell you this. People are going to let you down. But here's a news flash. Are you ready? You're going to let people down. You may mean it, you may not mean it, but I'm going to tell you, you are going to let people down. Why? Because we're, say it with me, imperfect people. See, if we write people off because of their imperfections, we'll soon find out there's nobody left to relate with. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, as the scripture says, this was as the scripture says, no one is righteous not even one. So here's the hope. Are you ready for the hope? We cannot establish enduring relationships on our own. That doesn't sound too hopeful, does it? Maybe I better keep going. But God has a plan for our relationships that supersedes our inabilities. Can somebody say amen to that this morning? Yes, people are imperfect. Yes, we're imperfect. But God has a plan for your relationships that supersede your, your inabilities, your inadequacies in yourself and in your life and even the other people because you know you're perfect. But those other imperfect people that you're struggling to relate with, God has a plan plan that supersedes their inadequacies, their inabilities as well. Can somebody say amen? amen? But here's another key to it. Enduring relationships are established by grace. Not only do we need to kind of get rid of the notion of looking for, for a perfect relationship, but enduring relationships are established by grace here here's the first thing with that establishing a relationship by grace enduring relationships are god inspired enduring relationships are god inspired proverbs chapter 19 and verse 14 says fathers can give their sons an inheritance of houses and wealth i need to talk to my dad about this but it's the second part that's so important 
but only the Lord can give an understanding life. See, there's, there's some things that we can do as human beings, but what we can't establish the right relationship. Only God can do that. Did you hear, Pastor? It's not my opinion this morning. It's what the Word of God says. Only God has the right, the perfect plan for our relationships. See, God gave Adam and Eve someone just right for them. And that's his plan for you. God gave Adam and Eve somebody just right for them, and that's his plan for you and for I. And somebody would say, but there was only two of them back then. It was so easy for them to know who the right mate was for them at that time. But here's the key point. Here's the important point of that whole thing. God provided Eve for Adam and God provided Adam for Eve. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. There is such a great temptation today to get outside of God's will when it comes to our relationships. Now, I didn't read this part of the scripture, but if we were to go back and look at this passage of scripture, in between God saying, I will make a helper comparable for him or a helper that's, that's just right for him, and God actually taking the rib out of Adam, and Adam saying, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, in between that, God begins to pull up out of the earth, he begins to create out of the earth every other living being on earth. And he brings them all past Adam, every single one. Adam named every single Adam, uh, animal, insect, bird, fish. Adam named them all. God brought them before him. And then it says, but out of all of them, there was not found a right companion for Adam. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Do you think God was really bringing all those creatures before Adam, trying to figure out which was the right one for him? No. Our God is too awesome for that. So what was he doing? Oh yeah, he was following his plan of creation, yes. He had given Adam, man, dominion over the earth. Part of the dominion was the ability not to create, but to name the animals and the creatures. Adam and Eve had complete authority over the animals. When they spoke, the animals listened to them. I don't know what we're going to do about our cat. <laughs> he just has a mind of his own. You can tell the curse is in effect. God is showing Adam all the options so that when he comes to the right option, when he comes to Eve, Adam will immediately know this is God's plan and purpose for my life. Listen, how many animals went past you in that process of trying to figure out whom God wanted you to marry? Think about that. How many options are there out there that are the wrong option, 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 and they can be good people, they can be wonderful people, but they're not the plan that God has set in order for you. I know there are these individuals today that look at Adam and Eve as just the father and mother of creation. They look at Adam and Eve. God created Adam and God created Eve, and then he said, you know, y'all go out, you know, multiply, fill the earth, and hey, just have at it. Y'all just figure it out from here. But just as God created Eve for Adam and then gave Adam to Eve, God has created that individual and individuals just for you. See, I'm talking about romantic, but I'm also talking about friendships. God has the right friendships for you. He has the right relationships for you. It's not happenstance. It's not miss and chance. God really knows how he wants to set up the plan of your life. Had opportunity just a couple of weeks ago to reconnect with some veteran missionaries that Sister Fran and I have known for years, David and Beth Grant. David and Beth Grant have been missionaries to India for, I don't know, 30 years or more. David was an evangelist to India long before he married Beth. As a matter of fact, he was getting along in life if a guy can be an old maid, he was getting there. 
but he had determined that he was going to live his life for the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, he had it in his heart to have a mate, to have a spouse, to have a wife. He had that in his heart, but he had determined that he was going to have God's right choice for his life. Now, I don't know if this is the wise way to go about it, but he said, I'm not even going to pursue. God's going to have to tell me, and when God tells me, then that's what I'm going to go after. So he was back stateside at this one particular time and doing services here in the United States, and he met Beth. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him, and right before he took off on his next trip to India, he wrote to Beth and said, I'm going to marry you. And she got the letter and she said, this guy is crazy. <laughs> he is nuts. Well, there's a whole lot of stuff that went on. I won't share the whole story with you today. But just to make the story short, David and Beth Grant got married. And they've been serving the country of India as missionaries. As a matter of fact, they are the ones that develop Project Rescue. They are the ones that started out rescuing the children of prostitutes out of the brothels into orphanages and taking care of them. And you, some of you heard me tell the story of how now after 16 and 17 years of doing it, those young girls and young boys, they're, they're graduating high school and now going and they're sending them to college. Their life has been transformed and changed by this couple who determined to do it God's way. And God has given them a beautiful and long-lasting relationship. God has a plan for your life, but that relationship Relationship needs to be God inspired can somebody say amen to that this morning God doesn't have the perfect person for you now pastor you just no listen God doesn't have the perfect person for you he has the right person for you the right person for you the same principle applies to friendships you need to let God choose your friends can somebody say amen now somebody would say well pastor are you saying we shouldn't have unsaved friends no I would not say that. How in the world can we save people if we don't develop relationships with unsaved individuals? But who are your close friends? Who are those good friends? Who are the ones that you take advice from? Who are the ones that you share life with on a regular basis? Those individuals need to be those people that God has given you that inspiration for, brought you together, developed in your life. Whenever that happens and takes place, it endures. But listen, enduring relationships are also God-centric relationships. God-centric relationships. Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, a God-centric relationship is a relationship that is one that is completely centered on God. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 3 says, Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. And so when we're looking at relationships, if we commit the choice of our relationships and the way we handle our relationships to the Lord, then what's going to happen? Our relationships will do what? They will succeed. They will endure the test of time. Here is where relationships either succeed or fail. See, we have to ask ourselves this question. What is the purpose of this relationship? This relationship either that I'm looking at or considering or this relationship that I'm already in. What's the purpose of this relationship? Is it to find companionship? How about to find security? I heard on a program just this past week that a person said, you know what women find sexy? A job. Get a job, buddy. If you want to get married, get a job. So. Amen. Is the relationship about finding security? Is it about finding love or friendship? What's the relationship about? Is it to have someone to share life with? Let me ask you, is there anything wrong with any of those reasons? No, there's absolutely nothing wrong with any of those reasons. Those are good reasons to be in relationship and have relationship. No, there's nothing wrong, but we need to realize that there's nothing wrong with those things, but for a relationship to endure the test of time, it's primary. 
Its primary reason for existence must be to honor God and to fulfill his purpose. The very first reason, the very number one reason, not the secondary reason, not, well, yeah, we'll go to church, not, not that, yes, God will be a part, yes, that we'll, we'll get married in the church and honor God in that way. The primary reason, and I know not everybody's going to get this this morning, but I'm going to say it several times, and I'm believing the Holy Spirit is going to speak to some people because I know, I understand right now, as we're listening to this in our flesh and in our, in our, 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 our carnal mind and what Pastor is saying as we're thinking about this in our own way, our own perception, some of you today are thinking, well, Pastor Hensel is just an old fuddy-duddy. He's just a preacher and he doesn't understand, he doesn't know. Listen, I'm gonna be just as clear as I can be about this. Yes, I'm a preacher and I'm a pastor, but I'm a man. And I was a man out in the world. And I was a man living the way the world wanted me to live. But it wasn't until I accepted God's plan and purpose for my life that I fully understood that this woman was God's plan and purpose for my life. And whenever I understood that, whenever I grasped that God-inspired relationship, and then I began to understand that the only way this relationship would stand the test of time is if it was a God-centered relationship, that the primary purpose of Fran and I being together was to honor God and to fulfill his purpose. Now the enemy can throw anything he wants. Do you hear what pastor's saying? And this relationship will endure the test of time, not because we're perfect people, not because we're so great, just like you, because you want to honor God and fulfill his purpose with your relationship and God will cause that relationship to succeed because if you cast your actions, if you put your actions to the Lord, then your plans will what? Succeed. God is so good. The enemy will lie to you, young man. He'll say, God picked somebody out for me. She's going to be ugly. <laughs> that young woman says, well, God, he'll probably pick me out some little mama's boy. No, real men. Come on, guys, back me up on this. Real men love God, amen? amen. Come on, men. Real men love God, amen? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. See, biblical relationships that I'd mentioned earlier were not perfect, but they endured. Why did they endure? They endured because they were centered on God's will. Look back for a moment with Abraham and Sarah with me. Abraham and Sarah's relationship endured the trials because what they were determined to do God's will. Think about for a moment. Abraham and Sarah's relationship endured not being able to have children. What do you keep reading about Abraham the whole way through? He wants a son. He wants a son. He wants a son. Sarah's not giving him a son. Sarah wants a son. She's not getting a son. God, it, their relationship endured through all of that. Not just a couple of months. Not just a couple of years. I pastored individuals that wanted to call it quits after a couple of years because they wanted children and couldn't have children. I'm talking about decades they went through this. But their relationship endured the test of time. Why? Because their relationship was centered on God's will. And even when they messed up, and how many of y'all know there can be mistakes made in marriages? Anybody of y'all figured that out? What was the mistake? Hagar and Ishmael. I mean, right in the middle of this marriage relationship, they try to do it their way instead of God's way. And Sarah says, well, Abraham, why don't you just go ahead and take Hagar and have a son to him? So, you know, and I know she had to twist Abraham's arm because no man would do that, you know. But they survived that as well. And listen, even after Isaac was born, the son of promise, what they'd wanted all their life, they were still so centered on doing God's will that Abraham was willing to take Isaac and lay him on the altar and offering back to God the prized thing that he desired all of his life. Why? Because their relationship was centered on doing God's will. What about Jacob and Rachel's relationship? It endured because they were determined to live for God. Think about this. Put it in real life time. When, when, when Jacob went to Rachel and said, 
Rachel, I'm going to take you away from Laban. I'm going to take you away from your dad. I'm going to take you away from your family. I'm going to take you away from your country. I'm going to take you away from everything you know and everybody you know. Ladies, think about that for a moment this morning. Do you know what Rachel said to him? Rachel said to him right there in Genesis chapter 31 and verse 16, she didn't throw a fit. She didn't, she didn't stomp around. She didn't give him the cold shoulder. She said, whatever God has said to do, do it. Whatever God has said to do, do it. What about David and Jonathan? They had a strong friendship that endured because God, what? God came first. David began to get promoted. Jonathan was the heir to the throne. He was the next king. Think about it. Jonathan got promoted. Jonathan, I mean, David got promoted. David had the favor of God on him. As, as things went by, the blessing of God continued to show on David. But instead of becoming jealous, their friendship became even stronger. And Jonathan was willing to give up the throne. Why? To fulfill God's will. 1 Samuel 23, verse 17, Jonathan says to David, you shall be king over Israel and I shall be next to you. And in the next verse it says, even my father Saul knows this. That's relationships that are centered on knowing and doing God's will. Relationships that endure have at their core value a desire to fulfill God's purpose. So what's God's purpose for your relationship? I'm giving you the best marriage counseling. I'm giving you the best friendship counseling I can give you right now. What's God's purpose for your relationship? If he has brought you together with somebody else, he has a purpose for that relationship. What's the purpose that God has for that relationship? I like what Alan Griffin says about married couples. He said, married Christian couples ought to be constantly thinking about how to dominate the world for Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen to that this morning? God-centered relationships. But here's a wonderful blessing. Enduring relationships are also resourced by God. Resourced by God. See, God gave Abraham and Sarah all they needed to fulfill his purpose for their life. Can somebody say amen? And then some. God didn't have any problem with making them some of the richest or the richest couple in that area. As a matter of fact, they were asked to move out of the country that they were in because the king came to them and said, you are greater. One family, one guy, you are greater than this whole nation. We want you to move someplace else. God took care of Jacob and Rachel and when the famine threatened their entire family, what did God do? He turned a whole nation, the nation of Egypt, upside down and established a way for Israel's family to be provided for, but not only provided for, but Israel's family to be blessed to become the mighty nation and people of Israel. And God raised David up, what? To be king over Israel. And not only to be king over Israel, but to defeat all of the enemies around him. And somebody would say, well, what about Jonathan? God hadn't forgot about Jonathan either, because once David was king, David honored Jonathan by honoring his son, Mesibetheth. See, God has a plan. He has a plan to provide. He has a plan to resource that relationship when it's according to his will. See, when God is at the center of our relationships, he will also resource the mission he has called you to. And that's why it's so important for us to know what's the purpose, what's God's purpose in this relationship? Because whenever God has the purpose and we have that purpose understood in our lives, then God will resource the purpose he has called us to. God will resource the mission he has called us to. Folks, as long as we're living just to simply accomplish our own will and our own goals and our own vision, then we're kind of on our own. Does that mean God won't take care of you? No, God will take care of his children. Can somebody say amen? I'm talking about a greater thing, amen? How many of y'all want to live in the fullness of what God has for you, amen? How many of y'all want to live in the richness that God has for you? How many of y'all want to live in the abundance that God has for you? When we know what the purpose is God has for us, then God will resource that mission that he's called us to. Pastor, how do you know that well I'm, I'm I'm just sticking to the word Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 and my God shall supply all of your needs according to what according to his riches and glory pastor what does that have to do with resourcing the mission well you have to read the whole text and I wasn't going to do that today but what was Paul talking about Paul was on a mission for God and the Philippians had come alongside and resourced that mission and what was Paul saying as long as you continue to stay on mission for God God also will supply all 
of your needs according to his riches and glory. And he's got a lot of riches and glory. Can you say amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. See, God-centered relationships are not perfect. The enemy will lie to you. He'll say there's that perfect individual out there. And once you find them, I found there's two things that men and women believe that are false when it comes to getting married. Women like projects. <clears throat> and so whenever they're getting married and they see some of those imperfections and how many of y'all figured out that you don't really see all the imperfections until you've been living with somebody for a while? They're convinced, I can change him. You know what the misconceptions of men are whenever they marry that beautiful bride? She'll never change. <laughs> so God-centered relationships are not perfect. They are enduring, though. Why? Because they're established in grace. They're God-inspired, God-centered, God-resourced relationships, and they will withstand the test of time. As our musicians have come back and they're preparing to lead us in some worship, as they begin to play, I want to ask you this morning, are you willing to lay your relationships on the altar? Are you willing to lay your relationships on the altar? What about those relationships that don't exist yet? Let's start there. Some of you have probably been, been praying for some relationships. You know, I like to get myself in trouble. <clears throat> There's one young lady here in the church that for a number of years kept praying for God to send her that mate. Now, I won't mention any names this morning, you know, but she's here in service this morning and she has red hair. Now I don't have any, you won't have any idea who I might be talking about this morning. But this lady prayed and she would come into the hour of power prayer meeting and she would, oh, I'm sorry, Anna, let me move over this way. And she would pray for God to send her the right man. Now, Some might think the jury is still out on that one. But Anna thinks God sent her the right man. Don't you, Anna? Praise God. Praise God. So what about the relationships that don't exist yet? The ones you're praying about. The ones you're asking God about. Don't get off course. Don't let the enemy throw you off course. Don't think that he's forgotten about you. Don't think that he doesn't have a plan. Don't make a choice that God is not in. Stay sensitive to the presence of God. Stay in the word of God. Let God speak to you clearly. Because once you hear from the Lord, you'll know. And it'll be with an imperfect person. But you'll know. What about relationships we're in already? Well, pastor, I'm married now and this isn't working out. Do you know how you know that you're married to the right person? You're married. That's why I tell couples, you're not married yet. I'm, I'm just being so transparent with you this morning. I'm just being just transparent with you this morning. I counsel premarital counsel young people and, and couples and folks that have been married before and now they're getting married again, you know. I'll be counseling them and they're already acting like they're married and they're not married yet. I'll look on Facebook and she's already taken the young man's last name. I said, no, no. Don't play house. This is too serious. Now's the time to determine is this relationship the will of God? 
I was a whitewater rafter for a number of years. Guided the Cheat River. The very first rapid on the river was called Decision Rapid. You know why? Because we would take the boat down Decision Rapid, rapid and it was a hard rapid, and we'd get to the other side, and we'd pull over to the bank, and we'd say, now you need to make your decision. Are you going to go the rest of the way down the river with us, or do you want to get out now? Because once we hit the second rapid, there's no way to get off the river. you got to go down in the boat with us. Well, folks, marriage is like that. See, the first rapid is the courtship. The first rapid is the dating. The first rapid is getting to know the person and getting to know God's will and purpose. The second rapid is marriage. And once you go over the second rapid, you're married. Now, folks, I don't have time this morning to go into all of the things that Scripture has to say and that we know and understand. Pastor's not saying anybody should live under abuse. Can I just say that? Pastor's not saying anybody should live under abuse. But what about the friendships? Some of you have come out of the world recently. You've given your heart to the Lord. You, you got saved and yet you're hanging on to relationships that are trying to drag you back into the world again. What are you willing to do with those relationships? Are you ready to lay them on the altar? I know all relationships take two people. But here's the reality. The change of your relationship has to start with you. If it's a marriage relationship, the change in that marriage relationship must begin with you, not the other person. Quit praying, Lord, change them. Ask God, change me, change my heart, change my perspective. Help me to be the person you want me to be because God loves the other person and he's gonna be working on them already, amen. What about friendships? God, is this friendship a friendship you want me to have or not have, Lord God? Is it uplifting to you, Lord? Is it strengthening and encouraging to me? Is it keeping me on the pathway? I know some people right now that are in relationships that are drawing them away from God's will for their life. And even though I can put my input in, all I can do is watch as they're being drawn away in those relationships. It's heartbreaking. But you know what the great thing is? The moment you determine to give your relationships to God, the plan and purpose he always had, always had for them, he's got in mind how to get it back on track again and give you those types of relationships that are renewing and encouraging and refreshing, but honor God and fulfill his purposes for your life. So I ask again, are you willing to relay those relationships on the altar? for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to bow your heads with me for just a moment. I want to ask this question. Are you here today and you're listening to what I'm saying and there's truth ringing in what I'm saying, but right now you have another need in your life? And that need is that you need to set things right between you and God, between you and your heavenly Father. You need to ask the Lord for forgiveness. Not that you're a terrible person, but the scripture says that we all have sinned and fall short of God's standard for our life. So you need to set some things right. You need forgiveness for those things you have done that have grieved God. You need to ask the Lord to be the authority in your life, to begin to set your life on the path that he has for you. And if you're here this morning and you've never asked God's forgiveness, we want to give you that opportunity today. While no one's looking around, would you just simply slip up your hand and say, I've never asked God for forgiveness, but I'm asking him now. Would you slip up your hand? You know the Holy Spirit. I know the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now. That's that little tug inside of you, that little uh, anxiousness, that little urgency that you feel. That's, that's God speaking to you right now. If you've never asked him and you want to do it this morning, just slip up your hand. I won't embarrass you, I promise. But it'll be a tremendous blessing, the best decision you've ever made in your life. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Somebody else this morning? 
Somebody else going to respond? Praise God. Praise God. Maybe you're here today and you just need to set things right. You need to ask God for forgiveness once again and reaffirm him as the authority in your life. If that's you and you want to set things right between you and your heavenly father, would you slip up your hand and say, Father, this is me. Praise God. Thank you for raising your hand. Thank you for making that commitment to the Lord. Anyone else this morning before we pray? Now I'm going to ask you one more question. Are you here today? And with every fiber of your being and relying upon the help of the Lord through his Holy Spirit, you're willing to lay your relationships on the altar once again. If that's you, would you just stand to your feet? You're willing to lay your relationships on the altar for the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you just stand to your feet this morning? Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. We're gonna pray. For those of you who need to uh, ask God for forgiveness, whether it's your first time or, uh, or a renewed time, I want you to pray with Pastor this morning. And I want to encourage everybody to renew their relationship again this morning. Would you just say with me, Heavenly Father, I know you love me. That's why I'm calling out to you this morning. Jesus, you didn't just talk love. You demonstrated love by coming, living a sinless life, and dying on the cross for me. So Jesus, I humbly ask, forgive me for every wrong choice I've ever made. I turn the entirety of my life past and present and future over to you. I ask for your forgiveness and I trust in your love. And so by faith, I receive your forgiveness now. Wash me clean. Clean my mind. Clean my spirit. Clean my heart for you. Now Jesus, Take control of my life. Be the ultimate authority over my life from this day forward. And for those of you who are desirous today to lay your relationships on the altar for God, that doesn't mean anything's wrong in your relationships. That just simply means that you're going to allow the Holy Spirit to evaluate every aspect of your relationship. As you stand in the presence of God this morning, would you join Pastor as we pray? You can pray what I'm praying. You can pray what you feel to pray this morning. But we're going to pray, Father God, we know that you have a plan and purpose for our lives. Lord, you have a mission that you have called us to. And Lord, our heart's desire is to fulfill that mission in our lives. We know that you've given us relationships in order to accomplish that purpose. And so we pray now, Lord. We lay every relationship on the altar. In other words, Father, we give every relationship over to your evaluation. Speak to our hearts, Lord God. If there's a relationship we're not supposed to be in, Lord God, then help us to know it. Help us to realize it, Lord God. And give us wisdom in how to deal with it. Father, if there's a relationship that we've rejected because of unforgiveness, Lord God, we lay that relationship on the altar. And ask, Father God, that you help us to have a forgiving heart by the grace of your spirit to renew that relationship Father God whether it's friendship dear Lord God whether it's romantic relationship Father God we give all of our relationships those the present and those in the future over to you and Father God those in the past we offer to you dear Lord God for any healing that needs to take place but Father we want to stand strong in you we want our relationships to endure, and most of all, we want them to honor you and to fulfill your perfect will. Now, Father, I pray for all of those that stand in your presence today. 
I ask, dear Lord God, that you administer by your spirit. For there is no way for us to know all of the complexities of each of these relationships. All of the needs that are present in those relationships, dear Lord God. But you know. You know the healing that needs to take place. You know the wisdom and guidance that needs to take place. And so we pray the prayer of faith today, Father God, asking for you to minister through your word and by your spirit in every individual life today, encouraging, strengthening, blessing, guiding, dear Lord God, according to your perfect will. And Father, as we do so, we put our complete faith and trust in you. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And the saints of God said...